Hi, I'm Joanne Giron. I'm a clinical psychologist and a therapist. And this is... I'm Tom Link. I'm a research psychologist and we both teach at Pierce College. And this is our kitchen. <laughs> and we are going to be doing a series of short videos on topics in psychology. And today, uh, Tom is going to talk about schemas. So, Tom, schemas. So schemas are a central topic to many topics in psychology, including cognitive development, like Piaget's theory of cognitive development, uh, memory, learning, and social psychology. One of the reasons we picked this was it was a huge deal when I was in graduate school, but it wasn't a big deal in Joanne's education. It's one of the things we've learned from each other. So, so Tom, why do schemas matter? <laughs> why are they important? How are they useful? So schemas are really important because they're a, a simple way of organizing information and they can help us see how people, what choices people think about, what reactions they have to those choices. And although we all create schemas um, and a schema is simply a way of organizing information in one's mind, um, our schemas are amazingly individual and personal. Um, we often want to know things interesting and strange things about a person's life. Oh, you traveled across the sea or, oh, you had this wonderful experience. Um, but schemas tell us a little bit about what their normal is and that helps us understand, uh, I think, a kind of a hidden but very important part of ourselves. So schemas tell us about what a person's normal is. So would that be like when, um, you know, when you're a little kid and you go to dinner at somebody else's house? That's and you find example. out that they do things differently from you somehow. Um, I don't know. Uh, they don't sit down at the table to eat. They sit in the living room and watch TV and eat. And you, that never even occurred to you exactly. that that was a possibility. They say grace or they don't say grace. Or right, people reach for stuff immediately versus people um, wait and ask and pass, things like that. It's a wonderful example, actually. Um, and it's funny because one of the... The, the pieces I've set up for is uh, silverware, so okay. it'll relate perfectly. Um, yeah, so here's a basic model on the screen of uh, a generic model of what a schema is. We all know if you see the, um, the boxes, they're pretty obvious. You have, you have things, you categorize them and subcategorize them, right? Uh, if we had the category of utensils with things that we use to get food from a plate or a bowl to our mouth, um, we know that there are different kinds of utensils. What makes it psychological is really the circle and the gray box. The circle says, what do we focus on when we encounter a new situation? What do we, which aspects of the situation do we notice? And thus, and then what choices do we make based upon that? So if we walk into um, somebody else's kitchen and, or sit down to their dinner table and they start all reaching for the food immediately, you have a reaction because you have one type of, you categorize as one type of situation. This much movement means, oh my God, people are angry or people are, are, are disruptive or people are, I don't know, you're afraid that everybody's going to steal stuff. Um, you know, you, you see the difference between families where there's like one or two kids and families where there's eight. And mm -hmm. when, when there's, you know, if you don't go quick, you don't get seconds. Um, and so what do I notice in the situation? And then how do I categorize it? And the, so that's the first part, the circle. The second interesting part are these reactions and expectations. This is the real, you know, these two are the real psychological parts. That is, how do I react and how do I expect other people to react? Right? So you'll have people, you know, and they sit down and they sit and wait and look around. So we're going to say grace. You know, and they wait, and then who says grace? And how should I act during grace, right? So both what am I going to do and what do I think you're going to do? And then this is a simple diagram underneath this subcategory. Then there are separate subcategories, et cetera, so on. Mm -hmm. And in each time, we add this feeling component to it and this behavioral component to it. So the schema is illustrated in what I think you're going to do and what I'm going to do. Exactly. So I use my schemas as a reference point on how to behave and what to expect from the world. Exactly. Exactly. And so depending on how many subcategories, it's like, it's, oh, it's this kind of situation, so I need to act this way. And so at each point in the circle, we decide 
what type of situation it is. So we're actually gathering some information, maybe even some judgment about what do you think we're going to do. So I'm getting ready to do stuff because it's this kind. Another one that many people have familiarity with is you sit through a couple of classes and figure out what kind of teacher is it? Mm -hmm. What do they want from me? Is this a class where I can talk a lot? Is, do they want stories? Do they want one right answer? Do they want me to be creative and think? Mm -hmm. Am I going to have to get to know the other person? All of those things are this type of class versus that type. So it's a set of behaviors and expectations that vary across the different choices. I really think of it sometimes life is a multiple choice test, but we create the choices over time and the mm. choices are the subcategories. And oftentimes when we apply to social psych, it's which subcategories do we notice or not, or is the situation trying to influence us to see or not see. Mm -hmm. So, um, so if I go to eat at somebody's house and they're loud and at my house, we're always quiet at dinner. But when people get loud at my house, that means that it's a fight, right, that they're angry, going on, right. then I use my reference point. One of my subcategories here is mm -hmm. anger. Exactly. This is and a fight. A fight is better because anger is just right. Right. It's a fight situation. And then how do we fight? Everybody fights different. So now we have the subcategories, right? So your fight and my fight. It's, it's beautiful. You can see the same thing if you go to the park in the summer. Because some people have a picnics and they're shouting, I'm at the barbecue, you're way over there. Hey, how you doing? Good to see you. And there's literally three or four people in between. And it's not considered rude. Um, and the other people, uh, particularly in the Northwest, some of the Scandinavian folks, they sit quietly around. Well, it's very good to see you. You know? Yeah. And exactly. So we think somebody's doing something, that judgment piece. We think they're getting angry or, or getting ready for a fight when in fact it's their normal. Right. And that's that's a beautiful piece. And it fits, I think, across every aspect. That art fits across every aspect of psychology. And it can manifest in judgment also. Mm -hmm. So they're rude. Mm -hmm. Where, in fact, they're following their own schema for what, what good manners are. Exactly. Exactly. It's a beautiful piece. Um, let me show you a simple example because i got some funny pictures to go with it. Uh, talking about... Um, silverware here so these are I, I have asked students to take pictures of their silverware drawers mm -hmm. and because when people say oh what are the categories uh what's nice is physically we buy something to categorize and people say knives forks and spoons but really there's never just three most of them there's small and small forks large forks small spoons mm -hmm. large spoons and then usually like here right you've got some uh corn cup holders and whatnot. Down here is a really neat one from Tiana, a former student. Um, so even here we have small and, and large spoons. And why do we, we don't, this is a beautiful piece we'll pick up in later videos. Um, why do we make a distinction? You know, you might have five categories. I might have seven categories. You might have noticed that there's ni knives, steak knives, other knives, mm -hmm. and something else that could be knife-like up there, I'm not sure. Um, we only create a separation if it's meaningful to us. And right. this is what makes schemas personal. Um, so I might use 15 different knives. So knives are important to me. So I have different categories for the different knives. If you use 15 knives in 15 different ways. I might right, use 15 right. knives, but all, all the, same the same way. way. I don't care sure. whether it's serrated. I will use this knife. <laughs> if it doesn't work, I'll just grab this one. You know, right. uh, serrated knives versus the straight edge, this and that. This one just, and uh, uh, I asked her about this category, and she says, I said, what, what's in there? She goes, knives. And I said, what about the, oh, she goes, first she says, that's um, my grandfather's stuff. Then she says, it's Filipino stuff. Now, she's Filipino-American. Her grandfather grew up in the Philippines. I said, so what do you use them for? I don't use them. My grandfather uses them. So there are things I don't use. Or right? things my grandfather he uses, uses for the don't. Philippines. Exactly. So this, it, it speaks to this beautiful piece of this connection, and she sees it every day. She's connected and separate, and that dynamic is just... There's so much in that, we, not, not enough to go into in, in this brief video, but I want you to ponder that. That's, I think, kind of the magic of taking something simple like your silverware drawer. We haven't even gone into the junk drawer where the rest of it is, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. All right. Well, this is the end of our first podcast. Thanks for coming.
Thank you. Thanks, Tom.